This lecture will provide a quick review of the ECG findings associated with several illnesses and conditions. While looking at this ECG, one of the first things that you might notice is that there aren't any P waves. Instead, we can see a quivering baseline with interspersed QRS complexes. These atrial undulations are the result of rapid and erratic atrial depolarizations and are referred to as fibrillatory waves. These fibrillatory waves can be either fine, less than 1 mm in amplitude, or coarse, greater than 1 mm in amplitude. When they are fine and have a low amplitude, they can appear as a smooth, wavy line, or even as a flat isoelectric line. These fibrillatory waves have no association with the randomly dispersed QRS complexes. When the fibrillatory waves are imperceptible, the underlying rhythm can still be recognized via their regular RR intervals. With AFib, the RR intervals are generally unequal in duration. As in this ECG, some intervals will be longer, while others will be noticeably shorter. Closed group QRS complexes, however, may give the appearance of a regular rhythm. Furthermore, in the presence of complete heart block, a regular escape rhythm will be present. Classic finds we can expect to see in a case of acute pericarditis include widespread ST segment elevation with an upward concavity, widespread PR depression, and the inverse or absence of these findings in leads AVR and V1. Atrial flutter is a macro re entrant dysrhythmia characterized by rapid flutter waves with a sawtooth appearance. The ectopic atrial depolarizations are called flutter waves. They are not P waves. These flutter waves are usually best visualized in the inferior leads, in which they have a V shape. In this case, the flutter waves are best visualized in V1, where they are positive deflections. The absence of an isoelectric line between the atrial flutter waves results in a sawtooth appearance. The flutter rate is typically between 250 and 350 per minute. This can be measured by dividing 60 by the time interval between the peaks or troughs of the flutter waves. Alternatively, divide 1500 by the number of small boxes between them. In this case, the flutter rate is about 375 per minute. Although the flutter rate can be very rapid, typically only a portion of impulses are conducted to the ventricles. Physiologic conduction delay at the AV node usually limits the AV conduction ratio to between 2 to 1 and 4 to 1. If the AV conduction ratio is constant, then the rhythm will be regular. Otherwise, the RR intervals will be unequal. In this case, the conduction is variable, alternating between 3 to 1 and 4 to 1, meaning every third or fourth flutter wave conducts to the ventricles. Before we go on to look at more examples, let's quickly summarize the most important findings. Atrial flutter classically results in a sawtooth pattern, and conduction delay at the AV node typically results in a degree of AV block. Type 1 second degree AV block, also termed Mobitz 1 or Wickenbach, is characterized by progressive lengthening of successive PR intervals until an atrial impulse fails to conduct to the ventricles. The lack of conduction to the ventricles results in a pause in the rhythm and the absence of a QRS complex on the ECG. Notice how the baseline PR interval, that is, the first PR interval following a non conducted P wave, lengthens from beat to beat until a beat is dropped. Although it is obvious in this example, this finding can actually be quite subtle. In less conspicuous cases, it can help to compare the baseline PR interval, which is the shortest, with the PR interval preceding the non-conducted P wave, which is typically the largest. It is important to note that although the baseline PR interval is usually normal in duration, it can be prolonged if there is coexisting first degree heart block. Another finding typical of Mobitz 1, which is hard to appreciate in this illustration, is an RR interval that progressively shortens. The RR interval is the longest following a drop beat, and then shortens with successive beats until an atrial impulse fails to conduct to the ventricles. The ratio of atrial impulses that are conducted to the ventricles is usually between 3 to 2 and 7 to 6. However, this ratio can vary between cycles. Nonetheless, each group begins and ends with a P wave. In this example, the atrial to ventricular conduction ratio is 4 to 3. That is, for every 4 P waves, there are 3 QRS complexes. <laughs> 
Type 2 secondary AV block is characterized by constant PR intervals and an intermittent failure of the atrial impulse to conduct the ventricles. Unlike in Mobitz 1, the PR intervals are consistent between all conducted beats. As well, the R intervals are constant and the rhythm is regular until a beat is dropped. This can be referred to as a pattern irregularity. As in Mobitz 1, the ratio of atrial impulses that are conducted to the ventricles is usually between 3 to 2 and 7 to 6. Again, this ratio can vary between cycles. With 2 to 1 AV block, there is only one PR interval within a grouping. The PR intervals between the groups, however, are constant, as are the RR intervals, unless the degree of block is variable. When the degree of AV block is greater than 2 to 1, the dysrhythmia is referred to as high grade or advanced AV block. High grade AV block can be confused with third degree AV block. However, conducted P waves will have a consistent PR interval. With complete heart block, electrical impulses from the atria do not reach the ventricles. Instead, the atria and ventricles are controlled by independent pacemakers. This results in asynchronous activation of the upper and lower chambers of the heart. This is reflected on the ECG as atrioventricular dissociation, in which the P waves and QRS complexes occur completely independently of one another. Now let's take a closer look at this ECG. These are the P waves, and they are occurring at a regular rate, at approximately 115 beats per minute. The HL rate is based on the underlying rhythm, and in this case, the H are under control of the sinus node. Note not that all of the P waves are easy to identify. This P wave is abutted to the QRS complex, while this P wave has resulted in a distorted T wave. Sometimes, the P wave will not be visible at all because it is completely buried within a QRS complex. It is also important to note that the atrial rate can be irregular, such as when a patient with complete heart block has atrial fibrillation. Now let's take a look at the QRS complexes. They are also occurring at a regular rate of about 27 beats per minute. Note how the QRS complexes are occurring at regular intervals with no relation to the P waves whatsoever. The P waves are simply not conducting to the ventricles, and thus do not initiate any QRS complexes. The QRS complexes that emerge are due to an escape rhythm, which is slower than the sinus rate. This is important because AV dissociation by itself is not diagnostic of complete heart block. For example, it can also occur in ventricular tachycardia. So essentially, the CCG has two regular rhythms. The P waves are just marching along minding their own business, and the QRS complexes pop up when they can no longer wait for an electrical impulse to come through. There is no PR interval, just a random space between asynchronous P waves and QRS complexes. In this rhythm strip, you may have noticed that the QRS complex is rather narrow. Well, the morphology of the QRS complexes and the ventricular rate depends on the location of the escape pacemaker. When the block occurs at the level of the AV node and the escape pacemaker is in the AV junction, then a junctional escape rhythm appears with a narrow QRS complex and a rate usually between 40 to 60 beats per minute. When the block occurs below the level of the AV node and the escape pacemakers in the ventricles, then a ventricular escape rhythm appears. The QRS complex is wide, and the rate is usually between 20 to 40 beats per minute or less. Clinically, patients with a ventricular escape rhythm are usually more compromised. Note that the RR intervals on this ECG are markedly consistent from beat to beat. The ventricular rate is rapid, usually between 140 and 280 beats per minute. Interrograde activation of the ventricles via the normal pathways from the AV node results in a narrow QRS complex. However, pre-existing aberrancy, such as left bundle branch block, can result in an AVNRT rhythm with a wide QRS complex. Putting all of that together, we could thus far describe our findings on the CCG as a fast regular rhythm with a narrow QRS complex all typical features of a supraventricular tachycardia. Now if you look closely, you will notice that there aren't any P waves before the QRS complexes. Instead, there is a terminal deflection right after the QRS complex. Don't let this confuse you into thinking that the QRS complex is wide, because although the terminal wave abuts the end of the QRS complex, it is actually due to the P wave. Indeed, this terminal deflection is actually just the P wave showing up a little late to the party and distorting the end of the QRS complex. Retrograde conduction of a P wave is referred to as an atrial echo beat. In leads 2, 3, and AVF, the terminal deflection can result in what looks like an S wave. Since it's not actually due to the QRS complex but the P wave, it is referred to as a pseudo S wave. 
In leads V1 and V2, the terminal deflection can result in what looks like an R wave. This ECG reveals both pseudo S waves in lead 2 and pseudo R primed waves in V1. In sinus rhythm, however, none of these appendices should be present. The main ECG findings that can occur with left bundle branch block include QRS prolongation, broad R waves in left sided leads, large QS or RS waves in right sided leads, and a prolonged peak R time in leads V5 and V6. And remember to always keep in mind that a left bundle branch block can mimic, conceal, or be caused by myocardial ischemia or infarction. The ECG features associated with a right bundle branch block include QRS prolongation A large terminal R wave in right-sided leads A broad or slurred S wave in left-sided leads a prolonged peak R time in V1, and discordance of the ST segment and T wave. The fundamental electrocardiographic sign of electrical alternands is the alternating height of consecutive QRS complexes. For example, take a look at leads 2 and V1 in the CCG. There are essentially two sets of QRS complexes that alternate from beat to beat. There is one set of QRS complexes with lower voltage, and another set with relatively higher voltage. Electrical alternance most commonly occurs in patients with a large pericardial effusion. As the heart sways within the fluid-filled pericardial sac, its electrical axis changes resulting in QRS complexes of varying height. However, it can also occur in patients with other conditions, such as in those with a very fast supraventricular tachycardia. The main ECG findings that can occur with an isolated acute inferior MI include ST elevation in leads 2, 3, and AVF, and reciprocal ST depression in leads 1 and AVL, and sometimes V5 and V6 too. And remember to consider the analysis of right precordial leads because of the common co-involvement of the right ventricle. The main ECG findings that can occur with Tarsat de Point include polymorphism of QRS complexes with progressive changes in height, width, shape, and axis, and the recurring reversal of waveform polarity. Now, be aware that the rapid and gradual alteration of QRS complexes can be mistaken for ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation, however, is completely chaotic without any discernible pattern or similarity between adjacent waveforms. V-fib is a chaotic rhythm without any discernible pattern. The rhythm consists of completely disorganized electrical activity with undulations of varying shape and amplitude. It's so chaotic that if you were to draw an illustration of it, chances are that your sketch would actually be more organized. Essentially, the ECG just looks like a mess. There aren't any QRS complexes, P waves, or T waves. V-fib is one of the most common dysrhythmias that can cause cardiac arrest. Instead of the heart contracting in a coordinated manner, it just quivers and twitches. Circulation ceases, and within seconds it leads to loss of consciousness and apnea. This is a very important rhythm to recognize because it requires immediate action. It will deteriorate to asystole and death if not treated rapidly. Fortunately, ventricular fibrillation is one of the shockable rhythms. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation should be provided while defibrillator is being obtained, and a shock should be delivered once the rhythm is identified. Following the shock, CPR should resume for 2 minutes before another pulse and rhythm check is performed. To reiterate, CPR commences immediately after the shock is delivered. It is essential to keep interruptions in CPR to a minimum. For more information on management, please check out the latest ACLS algorithms. Now just one more thing I would like to add in regards to the ECG. Ventricular fibrillation can be classified as coarse or fine. In coarse VF, Fibrillatory waves are 3 mm or more in amplitude. In fine VF, the fibrillatory waves are less than 3 mm in amplitude. When the amplitude of the waves is low, the ECG reading may be confused with asystole. The distinction is important because asystole is not a shockable rhythm. Let's review the common findings of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. A short PR interval. The delta wave and QRS prolongation.